O Lord, who for our sake did fast 40 days and 40 nights, give us grace to have such self-control that our flesh, being controlled by the Spirit, may ever obey thy godly motions in mind and body, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we turn to page 72 of Martin Luther's, uh, I'm sorry, Charles Beard's Martin Luther and the Reformation till the close of the Diet of Arms. And we've been getting uh, some generalities on the German and Italian Renaissance. Uh, we'll just jump in here. He is an excellent type of scholar who, feeling bitterly the shame and scandal of ecclesiastical abuses, is anxious for the reform while at the same time unimpeachably and even zealously orthodox. The Immaculate Conception had no more passionate champion than when Pelling, who himself in orders, lived in that clerical circle of Guiler, of which Guiler is, in the eyes of posterity, a most conspicuous figure. It is characteristic of him that humanist as he was, he had not disengaged himself from patristic and medieval prejudices as to the reading of heathen books. He enunciated the strange paradox that while such Poets as Ovid, Juvenal, Tibullus, Catullus, Propertius, others. To be excluded from schools, Virgil, Lucan, and the Odes of Horace, and some plays of Plautus and Terence, might be taught to children, though unfit for young men, and especially for priests. He refused in 1503 to read Virgil with a pupil who came to him for that purpose, proposing to substitute solace. But a few years later, in the heat of a controversy with Loker, a humanist of Württemberg, he went much further, abjuring all pagan poets and recommending in their stead Prudentius Sedulius Baptista Montanus. No wonder that when quarrel between monks and poets burst into flame, one of the obscure men qualified Wimpfling as a medius Ruklinista, half a Ruklinist. There is a fine spirit of patriotism about some of the old German humanists, which we miss in the contemporary scholars of Italy. Side by side with a new interest in classical antiquity, grew up in their minds a desire to investigate the history of their own country and to revive the half forgotten glories of Barbarossa, of Otho the Great, of Charlemagne. The politics that find expression in the literature of the period are imperial. Partly the personality of Maximilian was attractive to men of letters. Partly there was a genuine longing for a strong government which should allay internal discussion and make the nation feared and respected abroad. These first historical researches were very crude and uncritical nor in that stage of knowledge could they be otherwise. <laughs> of course, the 19th century man will fix that, won't he? But they testify to a certain breadth of spirit which distinguishes the German from the Italian revival. This connection, Wimpfling deserves to again be mentioned. He published an epitome rerum in Germanicarum, as well as a catalog of the bishops of Strasbourg, while in an earlier work, the Germania, he labored to prove that from the days of Augustus, Alsace had always been German and always part of the empire. But another scholar of the Rhineland, Trithemius, better represents the historical studies of the time. He was abbot of the Benedictine Monastery of Spanheim near Kreuznach, which, under the influence of a sudden, sudden impulse, such as made Luther a monk, he entered when quite a youth. <clears throat> he spent the greater part of his life in literary labors. He is said to have collected a library of 2,000 volumes, then an enormous number in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew.
a catalog of his works, not all of which have emerged from obscurity of manuscript, is a long one. His books, De Illustribus Scriptoribus Germaniae and De Scriptoribus Ecclesiasticus are an early contribution to the history of literature. He partly wrote, partly edited chronicles, some of general interest, others relating to particular monasteries, which may be found in the great collections of documents relating to early German history. That, in addition to all this, he was the author of such books of piety as befitted a Benedictine abbot is not surprising. More characteristic is his devotion to certain occult studies in which he was the precursor of a man better known than himself, Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim, a good, pious, learned man with no tendency to revolt against the church and probably too much absorbed in his beloved books to discern the coming storm. The war between the Elector Palatine and Bavaria, which he himself chronicled, compelled him to leave Spanheim in 1504. When he returned, he found that he could not resume his interrupted rule. He took refuge in a monastery near Würzburg, where again he was chosen abbot and again found occupation in writing the history of the house. Here he died in 1516. Standing in a certain contrast to these grave churchmen were a class of wandering humanists, the knights errant of the revival, who cared less for the church than they did for erudition. These men passed restlessly from city to city, from university to university, always finding friends and always leaving behind them a fresh interest in new learning. But they form few permanent ties, and in a certain indifference to moral restraints, a frank enjoyment of natural delights stood much nearer. The Italian humanists and these serious scholars of whom I have hitherto spoken of these, Conrad Celtus, 1459 to 1508, may be taken as a type. He began his career characteristically enough by running away from home. He studied at many universities. He made the journey incumbent upon all rising scholars. But during the whole of his comparatively short life, he settled nowhere for long. His travels extended from Padua to Krakow, from Hungary, some say, to Iceland. Ingolstadt and Vienna were probably the places which had the best right to claim him as a resident. In the University of the latter city, the emperor Maximilian founded a college for the study of poetry and oratory, of which he was the head. His restlessness, however, was not wholly without a purpose. He had conceived a great work, Germania Illustrata, in which, in the spirit of patriotism characteristic of the German humanist, he intended to tell the story of his native land and describe its physical features. This never came to birth, but apart from Celtus's Latin poems, which are more voluminous than valuable, his travels resulted in the discovery of certain literary monuments which cannot be dissociated from his reputation. Among these is a poem in which an unknown author takes the name of Ligurinus, describes in ten books the deeds of Frederick I in the better known works of Roswitha, the nun of Gondersheim, who in the 10th century wrote so-called comedies in the hope of supplanting the dangerously seductive plays of Terence. Another discovery made by Celtus was the curious incised tablet called from Conrad Putinger, to whom he gave it, the Tabula Puteringiana, a map of the roads of the Roman Empire in the age of Theodosius the Great. The Ligurinus and Rose with a Celtus published in his lifetime. 
The Tabula Puteringiana was published in complete form in 1598. All these things give an impression of, impression of Celtus as more a man of letters than a mere scholar. He had a keen interest in the history and antiquities of his own country. To theology, he stood quite neutral, except that we find him on one occasion when suffering from a serious illness, having recourse not to the physicians, but to a favorite virgin. virgin, virgin. In his Latin poems, he successfully imitated the obscenity of Catullus, but there the resemblance ends. But literature was successfully cultivated by other than professional scholars. There was a class of men, especially in the free cities of the empire, wealthy of what among citizens was accounted patrician race, who to the functions of administration and diplomacy added a discerning patronage of art and letters and in some cases a careful cultivation of the latter. Such was Conrad Putinger of Augsburg, 1465 to 1547, who born 18 years before Luther survived him by a year, and so almost the whole of the humanistic and religious movement of his time. He had studied in Italy, where he had earned the friendship of Politian, and once he returned to pass a long life in the service of his native, native city and to form a great collection of classical and German antiquities. But the characteristic figure of this kind is Villebald Perkheimer of Nuremberg, 1470 to 1530. The two free cities, Augsburg and Nuremberg, were at this time in the zenith of their prosperity. The former, the residence of the Fuggers, Fuggers, the Rothschilds of the 16th century, was the cent center of German finance, while through the latter, the trade of the East was not yet diverted by Vasco da Gama's discovery, passed from Venice to Central Europe and his countless works of art on canvas, metal, wood, stone still remain to testify. The burghers of Nuremberg used their wealth nobly. To compare any other city in relation to artistic achievement with Florence seems an abuse of words. Yet if any deserves the distinction, it is Nuremberg of Michael Wolgenmoth and Peter Vischer of Adam Kraft and Albert, Dr Albert Durer. Here then, Willibald Perkheimer passed the greater part of his life in the service of the Republic, representing her upon many embassies, commanding her troops in Maximilian's war against the Swiss Confederates. He too had studied long in Italy, and was a master of the erudition of his time his literary activity, notwithstanding his political avocations, was both great and varied. He translated Greek classics and Greek fathers into Latin. He wrote a history of the Swiss War in which he himself had been engaged. He conformed to a literary fashion of the age in an ironic, ironical panegyric on his frequent companion, the gout. It followed from his position, his wealth, his literary cultivation, that she, he should be in the closest personal relations with the scholars of the time. He was a frequent correspondent with Rooklyn, Erasmus, Hutton. Conrad Keltus called the old patrician house at Nuremberg, where Perkheimer and his father had dwelt, his diversorium literarium. His portrait by his lifelong friend Albert Durer is well known to all students of the period. A stately burgher of commanding presence with vigorous intellect and strong passions visibly impressed on every feature. He stands halfway, as it were, between humanism and the Reformation. When the strife between Rooklyn and the theologians of Cologne broke out, he was, in a silently acknowledged way, 
head of the Ruklinist party and crown the controversy with an apologia pro Ruklino. His name is one of those included in the bull which Leo X fulminated against Luther, an honor which he owed to Eck, against whom he had published a bitter satirical attack. But his sisters Caritas and Clara Perkheimer were successive abbesses of St. Clara Convent in Nuremberg. The first, a very noble woman, of great literary accomplishment, and the best type of Catholic piety. And Perkheimer never heartily threw in his lot with the religious movement, which disturbed and aimed to uproot much that was justly endeared to him both on the domestic and ethical side. When he died in 1530, he was hardly at one with either the new church or the old. Further north, Erfurt was the center of a remarkable body of humanists who were destined to play a very important part in the coming struggle between the modern and ancient learning. The Thuringian University had always, from the time of its foundation, manifested a certain liberality of spirit. It was there about the middle of the 15th century that the first devoured professors of poetry, Luther and Publicus, had taught. At the end of it, they, not, they, were not, they had not unworthy successors in Maternus, Pistorus, and Nicholas von Marshall men who, without altogether breaking with the past, had a genuine love of the classical languages and literature. To Marschalk, who removed to Wittenberg in 1502, is due to the introduction of the study of Greek into Erfurt. His edition of Prisian on syntax, there printed, was the first product of the German Greek press. Round Maternus gathered a group of young men who between 1500 and 1520 <coughs> gave Erfurt a kind of primacy among German universities. Among them were Johann Jager, better known as Crotus Rubianus, a man of biting wit, of whom we shall hear more presently. George Eberbach and his two sons, Heinrich and Peter, the latter of whom Latinized his name to Petraeus, Euricius Cordus, a Latin poet who poured out his soul in countless epigrams and was an ardent adherent of Luther's. Johann Lang, the last prior of the Augustinian convent in which Luther took refuge and among the first of the Protestant preachers of Erfurt. Spalatin, the chaplain and historiographer of Frederick the Wise, and a man who was destined to be the foremost scholar of a young generation, Jehoiakim Kameri Arius, the bosom friend and correspondent of Melanchthon. Here too came Hermann von den Busch, one of the wandering humanists, who in the excitement caused by his lectures is said to have swept away the old medieval textbooks and here Ulrich von Hutten, also a restless spirit, knitted many congenial friendships. But the head of the society has yet to be named, as well as the poet, who of his followers achieved the greatest contemporary fame. It was about 1506 that Erfurt poets transferred their allegiance from Maternus to Mutian. Conrad Moot, usually known as Mutianus Rufus, is one of the most remarkable, and at the same time, one of the engage, most engaging figures of the age. Born at Hamburg in 1471, he was a schoolfellow of Erasmus until Alexander Hegius at Deventer, then studied in Erfurt and finally turned his steps to Italy, where we hear him in intimate intercourse with Baptista Montanus and Pico della Mirandola. He came back to Germany in 1502 when he took service for a few months at the court of Landgrave of Hesse, but he soon exchanged his chances of worldly promotion for a scantily endowed canonry at Gotha, in the enjoyment of which he passed the rest of his life. 
Once at least, he refused substantial preferment. When on the death of Henning Goad in 1521, the elector Frederick offered him the vacant provostship of Le Schloss Kerk at Wittenberg, he quietly passed it on to Eustace Jonas. Jonas. He was content with his books and his friends, to whom an income more than sufficient for his personal wants enabled him to offer a modest hospitality. Over the entrance of his house at Gotha stood inscribed on golden letters, Beata Tranquillitas, while a little further on the words Bonus Junta Patient seemed to invite a guest to ask himself whether he is worthy of access to the shrine. Hither all through the years in which humanism flourished at Erfurt flocked troops of young men to sit at the feet of one whom they considered to be a master of all learning, sacred and profane. They were all the more welcome that their host had no pleasure in the company of his clerical colleagues who did not understand him and whom he understood only to despise. There was about eight mutin, something about him to attract the young of undoubted learning and with a mind always busy with the absorbing questions of the day, he yet wrote nothing. He collected books, he read, he talked. His only remains are letters to his familiar friends, of which, strange to say, some are still in manuscript, will all need careful editing and loving commentary. His method was essentially esoteric. He had secrets to impart to those whom he trusted and at the same time convictions which he concealed from the vulgar. His opinions on conformity were such as might be expected from his turn of mind. He had no sympathy with protest or rebellion. The wise man, he thought, discerned the truths hidden beneath familiar phrases, and discerning held his peace. Though he retained his church preferment and performed with more or less regularities the duties of his office, he was at heart neither Catholic nor Protestant, but only a scholar who loved and sought for the truth. He grasped the idea that Christianity is older than the nativity of Christ, and that the true Son of God is that divine wisdom of which the Jews had no monopoly who, he said, is our Savior, righteousness, peace, and joy. This is the Christ who has come down from heaven. Again, the clear commandment of God, which enlightens the eyes of the mind, has two heads, that thou love God and man as thyself. This law, pleasant to heaven and to men, makes us partakers of heavenly things. This is the natural law, not graven on tables of stone like that of Moses, not cut in brass like the Roman, not written on parchment paper, who with due piety partakes of this notable, notable and wholesome Eucharist accomplishes a divine action. For the true body of Christ is peace and concord. He had his interpretations of scripture too, which if not critical, or at least bold and evinced that theological courage which the young admire and love. Naturally, his followers, when they made <coughs> pil <coughs> pilgrimage to Gotha and received the welcome of his gracious presence, felt as if they were admitted to an inner shrine of wisdom from which the common herd was jealously shut out. They were not men who cared much for theology, and he was to them saint as well as sage, a leader as well as teacher. He gave them the impression of being too wise, too lofty, too detached to do the work which naturally fell upon themselves. He was as little capable of Erasmus's incessant literary activity as of Luther's fiery energy and persistence of will. Yet little as he is now known, his is the only name which some at least of his contemporaries would have put besides theirs. After Mutian, Mutian, who was the undisputed head of the school, its most distinguished member was Ebuan Hess, 
or as he delighted to call himself on the principle that every poet ought to have three names, Helius Eobanus Hessus. His real name was Eoban Cock, Eoban being a Thuringian saint, a follower of Saint Boniface. But he called himself Helius because he was born on Sunday and Hessus as being a native of Hess. While his companions, whatever the form of their literary efforts, all rejoiced in the name poet, he was one in very sober earnest. The author of many volumes of Latin verse in many meters and on many subjects. He thought himself and his friends thought him the greatest poet of the age. In one of his earliest poems, he declared that by his verse, he'd conferred the same immortality upon Erfurt as the Iliad upon Troy and Thebais on Thebes. He executed religious imitation of Ovid's Heroitis and translated not only Iliad and Theocritus, but the Psalms and Ecclesiastes in the Latin verse. Odes, epistles, pastorals, elegies, epigrams flowed incessantly from a pen which was always forcible, often eloquent and often incorrect. There's almost an element of pathos in Eobon's calm reliance, no matter what troubles beset him, on an immortality of fame. His contemporaries called him king, and he assumed the title of good faith. He did not know that he was working in a material that ensured his speedy oblivion, always in difficulties, always ready to forget them in copious potations, always making large demands upon the admiration and benevolence of his friends. He lectured at Erfurt, then became rector of the new gymnasium at Nuremberg, returned to Erfurt again, and finally went home to his native Hess to die at Marburg in 1540. He was one of the humanists who cordially welcomed Luther and the verses in which he celebrated the hero of the Reformation are all now that possess living interest. But the doctrine of justification by faith apparently did not help him to self-control. His double allegiance to wine and song remained unshaken to the last. Mutian, on the contrary, not only never left the Catholic Church, but returned more and more as he grew older into the ways of conventual piety. There's no reason to suppose that he sympathized with Luther's dogmatic system, and while his instincts were all in the direction of outward conformity, old age, poverty, neglect, the trouble of the times, would lead him to seek for religious consolation at the accustomed sources. His last words, however simple and touching as they are, are hardly the confessions of a repentant freethinker. Calling for a pen the day before he died, he wrote, The peasant knows many things of which the philosopher is ignorant, but Christ, who is our life, has died for us, and this I most firmly believe. He died at Gotha in 1526. The enumeration of a few comparatively celebrated names will, however, give a very inadequate idea of the literary activity of Germany at the end of the 15th beginning of the 16th century. The list might be almost indefinitely extended to show that every considerable city had one or more resident scholars eager in the cultivation and diffusion of the new learning. These men collected the books which the Italian and German press plentifully poured forth and made them the subjects of comment in a lively literary correspondence which filled the same place in the life of scholars as reviews and magazines do now. In many districts, men of letters were united in social bonds more or less close. Conrad Celtis formed a Rhenish and subsequently a Danubian society, each of which had for its object the cultivation of literature and art. This association quickened individual energy Men who exchanged the results of their studies felt that they were not alone, but working in the line of a great movement 
well, if controversy arose and sometimes deepened into quarrel, the resulting clash of words was at least better than stagnation. At the same time, this, like the corresponding period in Italy, was not fertile in the works of literary excellence. With few exceptions, the productions of humanists in prose and verse have their air of school exercises. And I guess here we'll bring this to a close. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh,